when when you look at the the prophetic pulse of what's going on in the Middle East, the possibility of Psalm 83, the destruction of Damascus. You know, if if Israel goes up and destroys Damascus, all hell's going to break loose. Are you kidding me? Elie Marzulli, it's great to have you back here on Charisma News. And this time we're talking about what is God saying about 2024 and beyond, if he's saying that. And uh, whenever I reached out to you, you immediately texted me back. I mean, it, it was seconds, I think, uh, that you get, that God woke you up recently, like about a couple of weeks ago at two in the morning with this powerful word. Uh, so I just want to let you share what that is, and then let's talk about that for a little bit. Sure. And thanks for having me back on. It's always good to see you and, and chat. Just so people know, uh, the Lord gets me up every night, I mean, without fail. Sometimes and and the, t the the times will vary, and there's this whole litany that we go through, where um, I sit and I recite all the scripture that he's had me memorize, and then after the scripture, uh, I sing this one song. Uh, it's a worship song, and and this has been going on for two years. He, before, before two years ago, that wasn't happening. Mm -hmm. He wasn't getting me up, but now it's like every night without fail. Now. Now, there are exceptions. Sometimes he, if I'm really exhausted and tired, he'll actually let me sleep through. So it's like, Oh, that's nice of him. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it really is. But most of the time, it's like, time to wake up and start. And I'm like, I'm going, I don't, no, no. And I, I'll roll over and pretend I'm not going to do it. He always wins out. I mean, you can't, you know, it's like, it's like arm wrestling. You know, you can hold him back for a while. Ah, boom. And that's what it's like. So, so this, um, this happened a couple of weeks back. And, and I've learned I keep a pen, I keep a pen and paper right by the bed, right by, mm -hmm. right on my nightstand. So it's like I'm not getting up and rushing out of the room, scrambling for something. It's like right there because I've learned over the years that when he does give me a word, when he gives me something like this, write it down immediately because you won't remember. I'll just give you an example. So probably 20 years ago, um, and this was really an amazing one, I'm laying in bed. And, and I realize, you know, some people out there, that's really woo-woo. And I get it. it. This doesn't happen every day. Trust me. So 20 years ago, or even longer than that, he gives me this word. I'm laying in bed like this, and these gold letters come down. My eyes are closed. These gold letters come down, and it spells Pisca like this. And I hear an audible voice. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, LA, that's certifiable. But I, I actually heard the, an audible voice, Pisca. And I just went, what? And and I, I got up and scrolled it down on a piece of paper going, I have no idea what this is. Maybe it's, wait, maybe it's way too much pizza or something, right? So the next morning I get up and I Google it. And sure enough, it's, we call it the Pisca promise. It's when, when Belem is supposed to be <clears throat> cursing mm -hmm. Israel and he doesn't. It's a blessing. Is God a man that he should lie or a son of man? That, that whole deal. That's what it's from. We used to call it the Pisca Promise, and we would recite that my wife and I every single day. We mm -hmm. would recite what we called the Pisca Promise, and so that's that's the way it works with me. Um, and I realize it's you know everybody. Th the Lord never does anything. It's like snowflakes. There's mm -hmm. always there's always different snowflakes. He never repeats himself. He's very very creative. So the other night, about two weeks ago, he gets me up. And he just gives me this thing. He just drops this thing. Like I said, usually it's one word. So I was really taken aback that it was like a phrase, an entire phrase, which to me is the phrase for 2024. That's what the phrase is. Um, I will be saying this at every conference. I've been e chatting it up even at interviews. So it was this. Now, no flesh, no sin, no death, no sting. Hail to the king. Hail to the king, hail to the king. No mm -hmm. flesh, no sin, no death, no sting. Hail to the king. That's the Bible in five in five lines. That's, that's the entire Bible. No flesh, the works of the flesh are gone. No sin, I'm in a glorified body. No death, because he's triumphed over death. And no sting of death. Hail to the king, because he's the one that did it. He's redeemed mm -hmm. us. He's totally redeemed us. He's the firstborn of creation. He's the firstborn of a dead, you know, so so he's preeminent in everything, which is I never understood. Why does he have to go through this? Because death 
enters into the human race through Adam. And the only way he can he can fix it is to take on the whole thing. So he does. Mm -hmm. And that's why when he when he becomes when he takes that on, it's like he's the first born from the dead. He's the prototype of the rapture. He's the prototype of where we're going. When he appears to the disciples, he's in his glorified body. He pops through the wall. How does that work? But then he sits down, total guy thing, right? He's been in the tomb for three days, total guy thing. Hey, you guys got anything to eat? I mean, <laughs> there's no humor in the Bible. And remember, he could have just gone like this. Hey, guys, don't be alarmed now. It's me. It's Jesus. I've just risen from the dead. I'm outside here knocking on the door. Just open it quietly, and I'll come in and greet you and tell you what's going on. But he doesn't do that. He, he disappears. Do that. Yeah. He just goes, ta-da! He just pops right through. They're all going, ah, it's a ghost. They're totally freaked out. And he's cracking up. And this mm -hmm. isn't the first time he's done that to him. He does this all through the Gospels, where I call it, you know, Jesus is goofing on the guys, because that's what he's doing. He's kind of like pulling a prank, but there's no humor in the Bible. I mean, just think about the walking on the water thing. Right. Here's another example. So he goes, well, you guys get in the boat. I'll catch up with you later. I mean, what's what's the first problem with this whole thing? Yeah. He doesn't have a motorboat. How's he going to catch up with us? And we all know the story. He's walking on the water. You know, hey, guys, it's me. Don't worry. Don't freak out. Not a ghost. He doesn't do that. He immediately and, you know, he goes up and he and he's interacting with him. I just love it. So. You know, the bottom line is. um, there was a mental picture that went with that at the same time. He, not a vision, just a mental picture that came in my mind. Mm -hmm. And I was on my white horse. We were not in the, in the army. We were not yet ranked up. We, we weren't in formation, but I was in this, this Glen, this clearing in a wooded area with about 20 or 30 other men on white horses. And I began, I said, no flesh, no sin. And then the other men joined in with me. No death, no sting. Hail to the king. Hail to the king. Hail to the king. And oh, I mean, wow. it was like something out of like Lord of the Rings almost. You know, we're going like, you know, just it was just amazing. And I just just sat there just stunned. I mean, just absolutely just stunned. So what does that all mean? And why um, that is for 2024. Combined with that, he gave me marching orders in March. Hmm. Um, to get the rest of the UFO films out by the end of the year. And at this, this time, we only had four films out in March. Since then, two more have come down the pike. We are in post-production of the last three. They will oh, be wow. out by the end of the year, God willing. In fact, my business partner, Gil Zimmerman, will come down this a week from tomorrow. He'll be down mm -hmm. here, hold up, and we will be putting the final touches on Roswell 1 and Roswell 2. And then Josh Peck is roughing out the timeline for what is the truth, which is number nine in the series. We are the mm -hmm. only Christian organization that's got nine films. It's like, better get those fingers right, L.A. Um, nine films on the phenomenon, I think. And it's a deep dive. It's, um, mm -hmm. it's really important. So it's the first time in 43 years of walking with him where he's ever given me a timeline like that. He's yeah. never given me a timeline. Get this out before the end of the year. So what does that all mean? I have no idea. You put all that together in some sort of a cosmic blender. What does it mean? Well, you know, when we look at what's going on in the Middle East, mm -hmm. um, there's, it's still too early to tell as, as of, you know, November, November the 10th. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm aware of the prophecies. I'm aware of Psalm 83, Isaiah 17, Jeremiah's prophecy with, with looks like it happens in Iran. Maybe the Bashir reactor is destroyed. I'm also keenly aware of Ezekiel 38. I have written on that mm -hmm. in my book, um, Politics, Prophecy, and the Supernatural, which is out of print. We're going to do a second edition before we reprint it. But I digress. Um, anything's possible, and everything is kind of looming. Mm. But we don't know. So, you know, yeah. we just sit there and watch. That's all. I don't make any predictions because the Lord's not telling me, giving me anything. But I do find it interesting that this no flesh, no sin, no death, no sting. I just I find that super interesting as well as where we are possibly mm -hmm. where we are prophetically, which we're looking at, like I just said, 
Psalm 83, Isaiah 17, the destruction of Damascus, the Psalm 83 war, Israel expands her body, borders, then Ezekiel 38, where Russia, Turkey, Libya, other countries join this confederacy and go up against mm -hmm. the land of unwalled villages. There are people who will argue about the land of unwalled villages, but Tel Aviv, we can certainly say, is a land of unwalled villages. It's like, and thousands of years ago, if you were a city, you had a big wall around that thing. Right. That that doesn't exist anymore because the advent of the airplane completely got rid of that because all you'd have to do is fly over and drop the bomb, and it's it's it. Mm -hmm. So Tel Aviv is a land of unwalled villages. Uh, how you know is an unwalled city? On the other hand, there are walls in Jerusalem and, and around to keep the suicide bombers out. I get that. Totally get that. But mm -hmm. that's, that's not the same, in my opinion, as a, a land of unwalled villages, because you drive all around Israel, and yeah. it's a land of unwalled villages, in my opinion. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's Ezekiel 38 certainly could be happening. And we see just recently Russia and Libya talking about warm water ports and all this. The wild card, wild card is Turkey. Mm -hmm. And anything's possible with Turkey. The idea of the Ottoman Empire uh, being cut up by the Brits and the French at the end of World War One, combining that with the Balfour Declaration. I mean, it's just you know you got to remember that and people don't understand because they don't they don't know their history. Mm -hmm. but the Balfour Declaration happens, and and right on the heels of World War One, when the Ottoman Empire is being carved up, that's why the Jews get Palestine. That's why because everybody else got all the other land around it. Yeah. So, you know, let's let's talk history here. It's just a small... In fact, the Jews got even less land than they were promised uh, through the Balfour Declaration. And uh, there's even... They, they even got less land than has been promised by God himself. Yeah, um, exactly. You know, they, they've never actually established the borders that God has declared that that, that, that land should be. I mean, the closest they got was under King David or King Solomon, where the, where the, the land... Where the, the kingdom was as big as it would ever be, and then it gets divided, and it has just continually shrunk since then, and it's been under attack this whole time. And so, you know, the last time that you and I had a chance to talk, uh, you were getting ready to go to Israel, and this was just before uh, October seventh, uh, where the where the attack happened. And so, your schedule has definitely changed quite a bit. <laughs> uh, so, um, but I find it really interesting that we see the puzzle coming together and all these different pieces are coming together and, and they're going to happen. We just don't know which one is the next one to fall into place. Uh, but we need to keep our eyes open, but yeah. you know, you were about to go there and what was the stuff that you were going to be, to be focused on this time? Well, it was a Nephilim tour, um, on the trail of a Nephilim tour. It's the only tour like it. We go to the ancient megalithic sites all throughout Israel. We go to where David and Goliath had that little skirmish there where mm -hmm. Goliath is killed. We go to places like Gilgal Raphaim, the Wheel of the Giants, uh, Nimrod's Castle, which in front of the castle are the ruins of this ancient arch to Baal. We go to Baal's throne, Tel Gezer, ancient megalithic site, home of the Horites, underground. Is there a connection between the Horites and the Paracas? Possible. Very, we don't know, mm -hmm. but you know, there's they weren't giants, we, and they were cave dwellers. They could see in the dark. They were underground, which is exactly what the Paracas people. We go to the the Doman Field um, near Gilgal Raphaim, and and we look at the megaliths that are there. So it's we go underneath the Temple Mount and look at those two huge stones mm -hmm. that the Romans later uh, repurposed and used in the wall. And some people say, well, this is you know, it's 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 got the Herodian, you know letters on them or the sign, but that all can be done. That can be repurposed. We don't know where those stones really came from. It's all conjecture hmm. on my part as well. I look at these things um, and I go, you know, this is um, conjecture, but they certainly are a very large megalithic stones. We also go um, to the mountain where the, uh, the cursed tablet was discovered mm -hmm. and um, very interesting. Because it says, it says, curse, 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 cursed of Yahweh, you will die cursed, 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 cursed. So we're looking at something here. And I was, when they, when they actually had the archaeologists and it was a very academic deal and, and I signed up for that. Mm -hmm. So I got to 
ask questions. And one of the questions I asked, of course, and I said, I am completely biased in this. I get it. I, I am totally biased. So this is not a, you know, um, I'm, I've, I've got an ax to grind here. Could it be possible because of where the location is? Of, of, it's on Jeremiah's altar. I, I'm mm. sorry. No, not, not, not Joshua. Joshua, right. It's on Joshua's altar right after AI. So the fact that it's there and, it, and it's buried, they've closed the site down. So it's on Joshua's altar. And I mean, this is the gateway to the promised land. And in, in my opinion, that cursed tablet is not to Israel. That cursed tablet is to the inhabitants of the land, i.e. the Nephilim. And mm-hmm. of course, when I, when I throw that out there, you know, eyebrows go up because most academics haven't delved into the Nephilim for yeah. the most part. But, um, you know, it raises some very interesting questions. We don't know. You know, we really don't know who wrote it and mm-hmm. who, who the curse is for. I just find it very, very severe that anybody would speak that over their, you know, their flesh and blood. I just, yeah. I have a problem with that. But again, I'm not in a, you know, I'm not into that mindset thousands of years ago. I, I don't know what that mindset is. It's conjecture on my part. But, you know, cursed, cursed, cursed. Cursed of Yahweh, you will die cursed. Cursed, cursed, cursed. And in my opinion, that just reeks of the the mandate Mm-hmm. to go out and slaughter the Nephilim tribes that are there. Remember, the Nephilim are the unholy progeny of fallen angels and the human women of earth. They're never supposed to be there. They're soulless. So that cursed tablet, to me, is speaks of that. That was one of the areas. I was going to lecture there mm-hmm. um, probably like for an hour. And same thing, we go to Mount Hermon and where all the mischief started. It's another place that we go to. Yeah. Uh, on the on the on the trail of a Nephilim tour, so it's really, and I lecture at all these places, so it's it's a very unique tour. It would be amazing to be able to go with you to do that sometime, uh, man. Uh, it's one of the reasons I'm praying for peace in Israel so that uh, we can have <laughs> these tours again. But uh, you know that that's really really interesting to be able to like go to these places that we read about in the Bible, and I've I've had the benefit of going to Israel. Um, but that was in 2003, 2004. Um, and so it was, you know, it was December to January. And so, uh, I got to do some really cool stuff there, but now as I'm, as I'm much older and more mature, um, I'd like to see this stuff again and it's, uh, yeah. it would be amazing, but we're, we, you just mentioned a, a couple passages of scripture, um, Psalm 83, Ezekiel 38, um, you know, uh, uh, several different things, you know, just prophetically, when you look at these, you know, you said you, you can't put anything in, you can't put that puzzle piece in place yet. But what are some things that you're just feeling as God spoke to you about this? Uh, no, no flesh, no sin, no death, no sting. Hail to the king, hail to the king, hail to the king. As God spoke to you that, what changes your perspective? Uh, how did that change your perspective from before to now? I'm in a glorified body there. I'm not, I'm not in this body. I've, I've been taken. I've been raptured. And that, that's why there's no flesh, mm. no sin. It's gone. And this goes back to when he, when he took me into the rapture for three seconds. And I realized, you know, that's, that's really, it's only happened. I've only been taken twice in 43 years, like Paul says, in the body or out of the body. Both both instances, I was there for three seconds. The mm-hmm. rapture one was just like the white horse one. That's about 20, 15, 20 years ago, whatever. And and all of a sudden, second one, I'm in this throng of people, as far mm-hmm. as I can see. Second two, I noticed this, there's this holy reverential silence that permeates the scene. We all know exactly what's happened and where we are. And we're not packed in like sardines. Mm-hmm. There is a space but we're all looking in the same direction and it's a holy reverential silence. Second three, I do this. I look down at my solar plexus because mm-hmm. my sin nature is gone. There's no more sin. My sin nature is gone. And so that, that, that word, no flesh, no sin, no death, no sting 
um, no sting, hail to the king, hail to the king. Um, I've been raptured. I'm in a glorified body. There's no sin. There's no flesh. Hmm. Death is gone. I will never experience death. It's not there. Now, I don't know what that means. I, I, you know, I can, I can tell you what I think it might mean. Mm -hmm. I'm not like going, thus saith the Lord, we're about to be raptured next Tuesday at 12 o'clock. I'm not saying that. But it would not surprise me at all, mm. given where we are. When you, when you look at, look, the whole thing in the Middle East could just die down, and that's it. On the other hand, everything in the Middle East could escalate like crazy. Right. Like right. crazy. We're seeing the anti-Semitism being ratcheted up in ways that I haven't seen. I mean, every anti-Semite is coming out of every every rock, every crevice. Right. It's unbelievable to see the hatred of God's people. And why? Why is that there? Hmm. It's there? It's there because Messiah came from their line and they hate yeah. Messiah. That that's really what we're looking at here. So I think there's a possibility with when when you look at the the prophetic pulse of what's going on in the Middle East, the possibility of Psalm 83, the destruction of Damascus. You know, if if Israel goes up and destroys Damascus, all hell's going to break loose. Are you kidding mm -hmm. me? The people aren't just going to sit by. So now that leads to Ezekiel 38. There's not an Arab in the bunch. That's where Russia and Turkey and the Scythians come in. And those are that's Afghanistan and Kazakhstan and all, Uzbekistan. That, that's all coming in from the east. I mean that they can't. The Israelis can't. You know that's that's crazy. Turkey's got one of the largest standing armies um, in, in the area. They've got an air force. They are well equipped. They've got boots on the ground. This isn't Hezbollah or Hamas. Yeah. It's a whole different deal. And we know from Ezekiel 38 that God Himself shows up. Mm -hmm. God Himself shows up. So this is different. But then you plug in the threat of nukes, which you got going between Ukraine and Russia. And then you plug in on top of that, the whole UFO thing, which is the game changer. And I was on, I was, um, I did a, 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 an interview, a couple of guys, both are, one in particular is um, a new ager. The other guy isn't, um, but they're not Christian. They don't, and, 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 and they were, after the interview, they said, L.A., what's, going, what's your take on what's going on in the Middle East? And I told them the same thing I'm telling mm -hmm. you. So it's interesting how a non-believer, knowing what we believe in the prophecies, when something happens over there, all of a sudden they're on the edge of their seat yeah. you know, yeah. and listening very intently. And so at the end of my uh, telling them what I believe was what might happen, educating them on Psalm 83, Isaiah 17, Ezekiel 38, and the progression thereof, um, uh, one of the guys said, well, this would be a really good time for the, for, you know, E.T., the aliens to show up and stop all this madness. And I, and I said to him, I said, <laughs> you, sir, just nailed it. You, sir, just told, you know, told me exactly, you, you just reverberated, mm -hmm, fed mm -hmm. back to me what I've been warning against for 30 years. This is the coming great deception. And I realized that, you know, people go, and 30 years ago, you know, I was laughed at, and, you know, that's never going to happen. And now we've got David Grush in Congress, which, by the way, is the, what is that, the the 18th or the 17th round? I think you said it was the 18th round. The 18th, 18th round. round. Yeah. yeah, when Grush, Grush leans forward to the microphone when uh, Representative Mace goes, you know, did you re retrieve biologics from these crashed UFOs? Yes, we retrieve biologics. And then she does the follow-up question. Were these biologics human or non-human? They were non-human. <laughs> it's like, you know, what are you doing? Yeah. That? And and that was, that interview was not picked up by any mainstream media. It wasn't. But mm -hmm. Jaime Masson's interview with the Goofy Mummies was broadcast everywhere, viral, yeah. everywhere. And what that does is obfuscate the water. It, it, it muddies everything up. So mm -hmm. what's the truth? You're not even sure what you're looking at. So, you know, the scenario could be uh, Psalm 83, Israel expands her borders. Damascus is destroyed because the Iranians jump into the fray. Hezbollah is firing. Remember, if, if Hezbollah really decides to do this, they've got upwards of over 200,000 missiles. The Iron Dome can't get them all. And mm -hmm. you're looking at, you know, two or 3,000 missiles an hour 
pouring into Israel, they can't stop them. So now we're looking at a full, a full fledged two front war. You got Gaza and, and watch Hamas, you know, come back again and start up again once Hezbollah joins the fray. Yeah. And if Hezbollah joins the fray and the Iranians get in, now we're looking at, uh, oh my gosh, Syria is now involved. Syria already is involved. I mean, the sleeper cells, and which are Iran's proxies in both southern Lebanon and Syria, they're already doing stuff. They're already attacking stuff. So it's a question of, you know, is it going to escalate or is it going to stand down? Well, it's not, they're not going away. They're doing it every single day. Mm-hmm. So at some point, it's. I think it's going to explode. I could be wrong. I don't know. That's why we watch and wait. But yeah. if, if Iran really starts going for it, or, or if Hezbollah starts firing rockets on Tel Aviv, they're going to go after Damascus. They've already told the Iranians, you do this, we're going to destroy Damascus. That's Isaiah 17. Damascus has become a ruinous heap. So then you've got Psalm 83, Isaiah 17, which leads to the Ezekiel 38 war. The question is, does the church go up before Ezekiel 38 war mm-hmm. or during or after? And we don't know. There's difference of opinions. So we yeah. don't know. So I just combined with no flesh, no sin, no death, no sting. I just wonder. And I'm not a date setter, guys. I'm not saying, you know, oh, say we're going to, the rapture is going to happen in June. I'm not saying that. I don't know. But, but part of me wonders, part of me wonders, and it's my blessed hope. You know, to I mean, can you imagine to be with the king, hail of the king, hail of the king, where there's no flesh, you know, there's no sin in your in our lives anymore. The, it, the sin nature is gone. There's no death. We're never going to experience death ever. We're never going to grow old and just wither away and die of some sickness. There is no death. There's no sting of death. It's all gone because of the king, hail to the king, hail to the king. It's like. It's way better than any Lord of the Rings ending. You know, yeah. I mean, it's just like, Amen. It's, 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 it's reality. In fact, Tolkien took the whole deal from the book of Revelation. I mean, that's in, in, in scripture. That's where he got it from. He just yeah. pieced yeah. it all together and created a fictional story. But the king is Jesus. Yeah. And yeah. he's coming back soon. And we might be going up soon. That's all. And we are definitely waiting on that return of the king in, uh, in, in so many different different ways there. And so even though there's uh, there's a lot of battles and uh, there's a lot of things that are that are going on right now, we know that the that the king is our great hope and uh, Amen. We with him. So, well, L.A., it's always great to talk with you. And uh, I appreciate you giving your the word that God has shared with you for 2024 and this season. So thank you for being here. on. Christmas. Thank you for having me on, John. Appreciate it.